Jesus' name. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. That name that is above every name. Hallelujah. That eventually every knee shall bow and every tongue shall come confess that Jesus Christ, he is Lord. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, God. Give him some glory. Give him some honor. Hallelujah. Help him to understand how grateful you are to have hands that can move so you can clap. Let him know how grateful you are to have a voice that you can speak with and praise him. Hallelujah. Let him know that you're grateful to have legs to stand on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Remind him that you know you didn't wake yourself up this morning. Tell him thank you for every heartbeat. Hallelujah. Tell him thank you for every breath you breathe. Hallelujah. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we even thank you for the electrons that you created. That man has found a way in his knowledge and wisdom to package and to help us deliver video and audio through those electrons and across space so that people who are sitting in their homes, people who are looking on their phones, people who are watching their televisions, people who are getting blessed through their iPads, amen, that you can take this place, take this presence, take this spirit, Lord God, and transmit it to those who are at home, amen? Hallelujah, and that your word can be conveyed to your people no matter where they are. Amen? Not only no matter where they are in their journey and in their walk, but where they are physically. We thank you, Lord. There's so many things we could thank you for. We could take up this whole time. We could take up two hours. We could take up more than that, Lord God, letting you know just how awesome you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, you're a way maker, Lord. <laughs> I wish we had time, amen. I wish we had the licensing rights. I could use some way maker right about now, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, saints online, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, hallelujah. And thank you, Brother Melvin, for that prayer. Hallelujah, I need prayer, amen. Hallelujah. I need all the strength that I can get. Amen. Amen. To do God's will, to do it his way. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. That is my prayer. Hallelujah. And as was mentioned before, we still want to continue to be mindful and prayerful of really everybody that's going through something that needs a touch from God, whether it's in their minds. Somebody's feeling lonely right now. Somebody doesn't see their way. Somebody can't see to tomorrow. We're going to go home to, to, to houses and apartments, wherever we live. We have a roof over our head. Somebody just lost their house. Somebody doesn't have a roof over their head. Somebody can't make it now that the government's not paying their way. Somebody can't handle all of this inflation. Somebody's money is running out. We want to pray for those people, amen? We want to pray for them if they need a move of God in their bodies. Amen. Amen. We want to pray for them if they're dealing with the ravages of war. All of the terrible things that come along with war. Amen. 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 So we want to be prayerful for all of those people because they're but for the grace of God go us. Amen. 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 So we thank God that he is our protector. And we ask, Lord God, that you would. Reach out and touch someone, Lord God, in Ukraine. Reach out and touch someone, Lord God, in Russia. Reach out and touch someone, Lord God, in that part of the world that's huddling in a corner somewhere, wondering whether they're going to make it to tomorrow, Lord God, wanting to know 
if you love them, Lord God, please reach out and find a way, Lord God, through your spirit to let them know that they're not alone and that you are with them and that you love them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, I, I hope that you all were, were blessed last week uh, as we endeavored to explore this whole idea of who our God is. Each and every one of us should be able to be a witness, amen, a character witness, and that can speak to experiences where God has shown up and showed out in your life, amen? We should all be willing and able to put our hands on the Bible and sit in that witness stand and tell the world about our God. And when we are done, they should have no question in their mind about the heart of our God. Because the only thing that's going to successfully combat all of the negativity in the world is for folks to really know the heart of our creator, amen? To really understand what's behind the cross. And we are left here. We're still breathing. We're still around in large measure to let the world know the heart of our God, amen? To introduce the world to our savior, amen? amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, it's particularly important that we are able to understand the heart of our God and share the heart of our God because of the nature of the material that we're covering, because of the question that we are tackling, amen, that we're grappling with, amen? amen. We dare only because God said it was time <laughs> to deal with this question of why do bad things, why do tragic things, why do painful things, why do terribly difficult things happen to good people. Amen? Amen? That's a challenging question. That's not an easy question. It's not a simple question. It's not a black or white question. And yet it's a question. It's a question that some ask in curiosity because they just like to know. There are others who ask because they'd like to really understand how God moves on the earth. Amen? And then there are others for whom it is a and a spiritually existential issue that separates them. This question, their answer to this question, their evaluation of God separates them from the presence and the love and the trust of God. For some who don't always come with the right attitude, who don't always say the perfect words, but for them this question is crucial. Most of us don't ask this question in any way that's challenging. We might be curious, but we're not worried about that. We trust God. We're still connected with God. But for somebody, that is not the case. Amen? Amen. And so there are many layers to this topic, and I'm going to do my best with God's help to, I can't give you the perfect answer, but I can give you some talking points. I can't give you the most perfect answer, but I can tell you how through the Bible to extract who God is and what we can say on the topic. Amen. 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 That's my goal this morning. If I can accomplish that, then God will be happy with me. Amen. Amen. Let's have just a brief moment of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for bringing us to this place. Lord God, we ask that you would touch our hearts as you touch my mind and my mouth. Lord God, we ask that we would be receptive vessels, Lord God, and that we would hear what you have to say, no matter where we are on the topic. If we're one that needs to tell somebody about you, Lord God, or if we're one that needs to hear about you, Lord God, we ask that you would reach out to wherever we are and touch us and ready us, Lord God, for your word, to hear it, and to absorb it, and then to use it. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen, 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 amen. and amen. Hey, hallelujah. 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 hallelujah, hallelujah. You may notice I'm trying to slow myself down. I'm trying not to use my voice so heavily, but I'm just telling you, it might happen anyway because I don't plan it, amen? Hallelujah. Now, as we prepare to transition from last week to this week. 
Please go with me, if you will, to the book of Jeremiah and chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29, where you will find the crying prophet, the writer of the book of Jeremiah, amen, and Lamentations, the crying prophet who never had anyone in his entire career to actually listen to his words and heed his words. That's a tough career, amen? amen. And he is letting the people of Judah know, because Israel's already fallen by the wayside. The northern kingdom has already fallen and he is telling the southern kingdom that God has reached out to you over and over and over and over again. You slapped him and he's taken it over and over again. He's given you oxygen in your lungs and you've praised other gods over and over and over and over again. And as merciful and as gracious as God is, it's finally time for you to reap what you sow. Amen. It's finally time for you to get the kind of punishment, but hear me now, the kind of punishment that a loving father would give. Oh, there's consequences to your actions, but what we want to double back for just a minute as we get ready to tackle this subject, we can't go there without you being reminded of who your God is. We can't Leave it to chance for somebody to imagine what God is like. Amen? Amen. We've got to have them face all of the craziness in this life with the sanity of the heart of our God. And so we see here in Jeremiah, as God is telling them their punishment, amen, prophesying what must come to pass because of their past and current at the time actions. Let's read together what the prophet spoke or wrote and spoke on behalf of God. While they are in rebellion and while he is doling out their punishment. It reads this way, for thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years, because the false prophet said, oh, it's just going to be a couple of years. But after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this very place. And this is sort of the punchline is in the middle of this, but you've got to read the whole thing to get what I want you to get. He says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you. I don't care what the word says, world says. I don't care what it feels like when you get your punishment. I know you might be mad at me. I know you may be disappointed. I know you may be blaming me. But let me just tell you what I am thinking about you in the midst of your punishment, in the midst of your continuous rebellion. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace. I know you've disappointed me. I know you've slapped me in the face. I know that you've worshiped other gods. But guess what? In the midst of your rebellion and my punishment of you, my thoughts toward you are thoughts of peace. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. And not evil. In the middle of the rebellion. As he says, you're going to have to go on a timeout. As he says, I'm going to take away your electronics. As he says, no, you can't visit your friends. As he says, stay off the phone. As he says, I'm going to shorten your curfew. He says, what I'm thinking toward you is peace and not evil. I'm already planning for your redemption. I'm already planning. While you're in rebellion. While I'm telling you the punishment. My heart. You have no idea. You think I'm mad at you. You think I hate you right now. And I'm telling you while I'm punishing you. I'm thinking about. I can't wait for the day. I'm literally planning. Your prodigal son and prodigal daughter. Feast. Oh, have mercy. 
He says, the thoughts that I think toward you are of peace and not of evil to give you the expected end. Then shall ye call upon me and ye shall go and pray unto me and I will listen to you. You need to know this. And ye shall seek me and find me. When ye shall search for me with all of your heart and I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And I will turn away your captivity and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you. I drove you there. Hallelujah. Amen. Saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place whence, whence, whence I cause you to be carried away captive. God says, I know the thoughts that I'm thinking about you. I know the way that my heart beats for you. And this is in the middle of the rebellion. This is in the middle of declaring the punishment. And so as we go through grappling with this particular topic, we cannot allow ourselves to go into it without understanding this is our God. This is his heart. Amen? Amen. When we dare to grapple with the subject of how do bad things happen to good people, we need to understand that God could never be happy with any suffering that we go through. But we've also got to understand because this question has packaged within it the question of how does God allow it? Why doesn't he do something about it? Why doesn't he solve all of my problems? How could he stand there and let me go through any pain? As you answer that question, you might get a picture of God that's the wrong picture. And that can take you down a road that heaven forbid you might not be able to come back from. And God wants you to come on home, amen? amen? You wanna have the opportunity to do that, but you could run away from home. You could be mad enough with God that you could run away from home and heaven forbid you don't find your way back. But you've got to have some memories. You've got to have something in your mind and in your heart that in that perfect moment that you'll say, oh, yes. I know that it's hard. I know I've gone through a lot. I know it seems like nobody loves me, but wait a minute. You need to have something to draw on to when you, so that you can come to yourself like the prodigal son and remember and realize what your father is really like. We can't go down a subject like this without being clear on that. And so that's why I ask you to go Back a little bit with me to see what Jeremiah wrote. Amen? Amen. Now, like I told you, I'm going to, I can't give you a perfect answer to this question. But I'm going to take you through, believe it or not, 10 points. Say 10 points. I'm going to take you through 10 points one by one, and I'm going to try to make good time in doing so. But the goal is for you to come away with enough in your mind. Amen? That you can write in your notes if you're writing so that you can address this particular very challenging issue, amen? amen? My goal is to teach, although you know I might get excited every now and then. So are you ready for point number one? Yes. Point number one is touchy. Point number one, if you don't listen to me all the way, point number one, if you don't really, really listen, you could be offended if you don't listen to me all the way, amen? Point number one comes from the particular section of scripture, one particular verse that, believe it or not, as I prepared to, as I began to prepare for this message, the first verse that jumped out at me, the first verse that God led me to, I said, really, where are you going with this, God? <laughs> it can be found in Matthew chapter seven, verse six. Matthew chapter seven, verse six. 
you see, you've heard this verse before, even if you haven't read it. And I said, Lord, where are you going with this? <laughs> but it's the first verse that he took me to. Amen. And it says, give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend, meaning tear you. He says, do not give what is holy, amen, to dogs. Don't cast your pearls in front of the swine because they will just trample on it. And when they're done trampling on your pearls, when they're done trampling on that which is holy, that which is precious to you, that that you gave with an open heart and an open mind of love, they will trample on it and turn around and attack you. Amen. That's the first thing that God gave to me. Amen. And I'm saying, Lord, woo, where are you going with this? Why is this important to mention right up front? Because among us here, we may have Christians, and I, I would imagine that we do, that, that want to help people. We may have people that, whose hearts are filled with compassion. We may have people whose hearts are even filled with compassion for those who are angry with God. Those who have an issue. Those who have an indictment on God. Amen? amen. And you want to have a word for them. Amen? amen? Well, the first thing you need to know. Don't throw your pearls to the swine. Amen? Amen. Are you hearing me? Amen. The real point I'm trying to get across to you is you need to be very careful and hear me out. Be very careful when someone asks or poses a question like this. I want you to care, but I want you to be careful. God wants you to care, but he is advising me and you. He's advising all of us, be careful. That's the Bible, by the way, that said, don't throw your pearls to the swine. That's not Pastor Mike. That's Jesus. It's in red. Amen. Don't throw your pearls to the swine because they, will, they might not, if they're swine, they will not appreciate it. And then they'll tear you apart as a result. They will not appreciate the preciousness. They will not appreciate the intent of the words. And they will attack the messenger because of where they've already decided they are on the issue. So if anybody asks you this question, why do good, bad things happen to good people? I need you to test them. I need you to test them. You need to say something that we say a lot in the field of medicine, in particular psychology or psychiatry. Tell me more. <laughs> Tell me more. Keep on talking. Or well, why do you ask the question? Don't say it in any sarcastic way. Just tell me more. Where are you going with this? You need to know this because of this. If the question is really a statement, if their question is really an indictment of God. If they just happen to be angry with God and they're really done with God and they're really asking you a question, that's a statement. My advice is proceed with caution and at your own risk and possibly your own peril because they will harm you. They will maim you. They may murder you with their mouth. If they are already done with God, if they're angry with God and they're just using you as a way to vent, they're really just using you to drag you into a trap, into an argument. To, that nothing you say is going to satisfy them. Don't go there. You are no doormat. Some of you on your jobs, I'm, I would imagine many of us, or in your life, you may have a person or a company or a system that you represent? How many of you all have people that you might represent or a company that you might represent or a system? And somebody may call you, whether you're in a call center or any place else, because something's gone wrong. They're angry. They're disappointed. They're frustrated. And they assume that the person or the company or the system let them down because they don't care. And they're angry. They're frustrated. 
And they handled that by posing a question. Why did this happen? How could this happen? What's going wrong? What's going on in this company? What's going on with that person? What did they have in mind? And here you are taking them at their word. Here you are taking them literally. And you just can't wait to explain. Oh, here's what really went wrong. Oh, they never intended to harm you. Oh, they never intended to defraud you. Oh, no, here's what really happened. It's not really what you think. It went like this. When you called and you asked for that, they thought you meant this, and they sent you there, but this is what happened. Nobody intended to harm you. This is the real situation. How many of you have done that? Only to find that your lips were moving, but they were not listening. <laughs> They, they, I, I learned early in my career that when somebody asks that question, I have to say, tell me more. Because much of the time, they don't want the answer. They just want to vent, and you represent the person or the company or the system, and they're just angry. And here's the other thing that's even worse. When you try to give those answers... You're, you think you're explaining, they hear you justifying. You think you're edifying, and they see you defending. They hear, you're giving them all the ins and outs. Here's what we really were thinking. This was the real intent. No, we love you. We can't, we're sorry. But what they hear, oh, you're just, you're part of the system, so you're defending the person. You're defending the company. You're defending the system, Amen. And so you have to learn early on, tell me more. <laughs> because really, if you really just want to use me as a doormat, I choose not to go there. If you really just want to go off on me, I choose not to go there. Now, you can't always resist it because some folks will take you there and you don't see it coming. But if you have the opportunity, if you have the wherewithal, I'm just advising from the very beginning, don't go there or proceed with caution because you will get your feelings hurt. Amen. Amen. And you will not have solved a thing. You will not help a soul because they didn't come to you for help. They came to you to go off. They came to you to express their anger. They came to you for you to say words that they can twist. They came to you so that you can throw your heart out there on behalf of God for them to trample over it. We are representing God here. But he doesn't need our help that bad for us to be trampled on. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And so... Even touching on this subject, even taking the time to cover it, is an expression of the abundance of grace and love of God. Because he wants people who are curious to have the answers. He wants people who just want to have a better relationship with him and to understand him better, to understand. But God is going through this process even for those who are angry with him, even for those who dare to say they would hate him. Have you ever said you hate your parents? Some people have. I hate you. He's even willing to go there. He's not suggesting that you go there, but God has chosen to cover this topic. I just want to make it clear that it's out of an abundance of love. He does not have to do it. He has no personal need to do it. He has no personal need for justification. This is purely out of love. Amen? So that is point number one. Make sure you test them and don't go there if they really just want to vent and hurt you. Amen? God is not asking you to be hurt on his behalf in this way. Point number two. I know it, I'm only at number two and I said I have ten. That means the other ones will go faster. Amen? Point number two. Why is it that bad things do happen in general? Forget about to who they happen. Why do they happen at all? This is an easy one, right? As soon as sin came into this world, we were destined to have bad things happen. If we don't accept the Bible, if we don't accept Genesis, then we won't have a common concept. We can't even have the conversation. And no, we didn't commit the sin. We inherited, amen? Amen. We inherited, as soon as sin came into the world, bad things were destined to happen to all kinds of folks. We inherit the effects of sin through our genetics, 
This is why our bodies slowly degrade. This is why we're subject to ailments and illnesses and sometimes all the way to death. Amen? Amen. Violence and selfishness and greed and all the other sins of pride negatively affect relationships between people. All of that was destined to happen. Why? Because of sin. So the simple answer when somebody asks, why do bad things happen to good people? You could just say because of sin and leave it at that. But you know, most people, that's not good enough. But even death is unavoidable. Why? Because of sin. In the book of Hebrews, Paul wrote chapter 9, you don't have to go there, verses 27 and 28. He says, it's appointed unto man once to die. And then the judgment. Because of sin, we can't avoid bad things. And if you consider death bad, you can't avoid that either. Amen? Amen. I know we joke around sometimes and we say there's two things that are unavoidable in this life, death and taxes. Well, one of those boxes I've checked many times over. Oh, I've paid some taxes. And one day, I will also, unless Jesus comes, unless the rapture comes before my death, I will lay my head down. And I will check the other box. But I will also understand in the process why that had to happen. Amen. Even if I consider myself a good person, even if you consider me a good person, I will still have to succumb to the ultimate effects of sin. Amen. Amen. But you may say, well, okay, I know we have to die and I know we have to suffer. I know that we have sin in the world. But isn't it more fair? Isn't it more right for good people? Good people should have at least more healing. Good people should have at least longer lives. Isn't that only fair? Good people should have less suffering, right? If they're going to die from an ailment, good people should at least have less pain. Isn't that only fair? And bad people should have shorter lives, right? Bad people should have more pain. Wouldn't that seem fair? So point number three, if you take the question there, who's good? And based on what? Why do bad things happen to good people? In whose opinion? God said we've all fallen short. Hallelujah. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. By whose measure are you calling somebody good? Mass murderers are somebody's child and somebody's buddy. And dare I say somebody's best friend. On what basis do you say that I am good? On what basis do you say this person is good? Based on what you know? Do you know how limited that is? That's point number three, amen? And, And let's just say you could measure goodness. Do you have your goodness measuring stick? Do you have your goodness measuring cup? Amen. Do you have your goodness protractor? Amen. What if you could? Where would you draw the line? How would you keep score? Where would the cutoff be? Where would mercy and grace end and punishment and judgment begin? Where would you put it? Who would you leave out? Who would you close the door saying it's closing time? Who, where would you draw that line? You don't like where God draws it. Where would you draw it? And guess what? As soon as you draw it, you're actually shutting yourself out. (laughs) Because as you step to God and ask him this question, if you ask it the wrong way, guess what? You already excluded yourself. Because like the rest of us, You're living with sin, but now you just shut yourself out from the grace and the mercy of the very one whose heart bleeds for you, whose son died for you, who who went to the garden and teared up and didn't want to go, but took all the punishment and took all the pain for you. If you could measure it, where would you draw the line and who would you be leaving out? That's point number three, amen? 
Where would you cut it off? Where would you say you get to have exposure to tragic things? You get to have exposure to terrible illness. You get to have a short life versus the long life. Where would you draw the line? Point number four. We don't know the whole story. You don't know all of God's purposes. All you have to do is think about Job. Just consider Job. Job's friends said, you know what? We believe that good things happen to good people. That's why you've been blessed all these years. And you clearly went somewhere wrong because that's why all these bad things are happening. Because bad things happen to bad people. So therefore, since all of these things are happening to you, since you've lost so much, Job, clearly you are now a bad person. Therefore, amen? Amen. His wife even said, you know what? This is not right, Job. You, I know you're an upstanding man. I know you don't deserve for your kids to be killed. I know you don't deserve for all the things you've lost. And God is continuing to punish you. Why don't you? Because it's so unfair. Why don't you just relieve yourself? Curse God and just die. Why put up with all this unfairness, Job? And Job himself even said, oh, Lord, why in the world? But eventually he came to understand. Amen. Amen. But they said bad things are supposed to happen to bad people and good things happen to good people. And since it's so unfair, since God is being so unfair to you and he clearly is not going to give you a square deal, just curse him and die. What if they knew what we know? What if they knew? that there's so much more to the story. What if they knew, Job, that God was actually allowing you to go th through this because he knew you could handle it. He, he letting you go through this so you can be an example to somebody else. He's allowing you to go through this because he is proud of you, not because he hates you or he's mad about you. Right. If you knew the whole story, if you knew God's real intentions, yeah you would handle situations differently. And so what is your job while you don't know? Your job is to handle it as if God loves you. Handle it as if God's in control. That's while you're in the midst of the pain. I'm just giving you points. Amen? What would you do? What would you say? What question would you ask if you knew the whole story? What question would you ask it? How would you ask it if you knew how it all ended? This takes us right back to Jeremiah. While God is punishing them, while they're in rebellion, he says, I think good thoughts toward you. I'm thinking about your fruitful end, Job. I'm thinking about your fruitful end, Michael. I'm thinking about your fruitful end, Jason and Jason. I'm thinking about your fruitful end, everybody out there watching and listening. I'm, that's what I'm thinking about. But in the midst of it, we can make stuff up. We can make stuff up about God, and we can make stuff up about people based on circumstances. So as we grapple with this question, why do bad things happen to good people, we need to understand all of these things, including you may not know the whole story. In fact, you probably don't know the whole story. Amen? Amen. Point number five, I'm getting there. Life on earth, by the way, have you figured this out? Life on earth doesn't work the way you think it would <laughs> very often. Amen? And many times it doesn't work the way you think it would or even should because of the heart of God. God is not like you. He's not like me. Amen? So you need to know this point number five. If you were to go to Matthew, and again, you don't have to go there, uh, chapter five, verse 45, what you see is that Jesus says, your father in heaven makes his, his son, now notice, his son to rise on the evil and on the good. We would have his son to rise only on the good and not on the evil. But Jesus says, your father in heaven makes his son rise on the evil, just like on the good. And he sends rain, which then gives you food on the just and the unjust. So if we were God, it wouldn't work like that. But we're talking about the heart of God. He still loves them. 
you would be done with them. You want to draw the line because you've decided they're bad and put them over there. But you're still breathing. Your heart's still ticking. And so God is still loving. So you're not going to have good just for good people. Amen. You're not going to have bad reserve just for bad people while we are here on earth while there is still time which takes us to point number six when you think about well shouldn't good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people well while you're here on this earth it's not going to all make sense like that but that's what eternity is for that's point number six <laughs> That's what eternity is for. For good things, only good things. I said only good things are going to happen to you in heaven. That's right. And unfortunately, some folks get offended when we mention it. But only bad things happen in hell. Amen? Okay. Hallelujah. There is coming a time. It is not now. Your measurements won't make sense now. It won't all seem fair now. But that's what eternity is for. For now, God's love can still reach all of us. For now, the, sin, the effects of sin also affect all of us. The good and the bad, the same and the unsaved. For now. That's the way it works. There'll come a time in eternity when bad for bad, and good for good. And we know that this unfairness or this seeming inequity has many manifestations. Some poor two-year-old gets hit by a car. Somebody has a miscarriage or stillbirth. Somebody that's good ends up getting ravaged with cancer all over their body and some knucklehead that is not thinking about God is still breathing, still seeming to prosper. A pastor who pours their heart out and gives everything that they have still seems to struggle and some shyster gets rich off of the people for now. That's just the way it is. Don't get mad at God. Don't hate God. This is a reflection of his love. And he hasn't. It's true. Removed all of the pain and all of the various manifestations of sin in this life. Wouldn't we love it if he did? But not for now. That's what eternity is for. Amen. Even King Solomon, he thought he had it all figured out. He was the most, you know, the wealthiest and the wisest man that ever lived in his time. If you look at what he wrote in the book of Ecclesiastes, I'm going to go there real quickly. You can go there if you want to. You don't have to. But Ecclesiastes chapter nine, verse 11, he says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not given to the swift, I thought it always would, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. He says, I don't understand, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't add up like I thought it would. He had to come to this realization it doesn't always work like you think it's going to work. It might make sense most of the time, but it's not going to make sense all of the time. Our issue, our problem is if in the few times that it doesn't make sense and somebody that's good has bad things happen to them. If that's somebody we love, if that's somebody we know, if that's somebody we care about, if that's somebody that looks like us. I won't go too far with that, but we don't judge all wars the way we judge this one. We don't worry about all people who are being ravaged in war like we worry about this one. 
But if they look like us, if they worship like us, if they talk like us, if they speak our language, if it's somebody that we know and we've determined is good and deserving, then we don't like it when bad things happen. But can I just tell you, even when you don't know, somebody suffering that's somebody else's child, somebody suffering that's in a, a country that you don't care about, you've never been to, and if they showed you on TV, you'd shine it on and move on to your next program. That's right. That's right. That's right. It's not going to work the way you think, amen? amen? Point number seven, the patterns of this life were not and are not as fixed and predictable as we'd like them to be. I said the patterns in this world and in this life are not as fixed and predictable as Solomon thought, amen? amen. And the same thing with us. We would think, well, if this, then that, right? And if that, then this. But when it doesn't work like that, is the formula wrong or is God wrong? Your formula's wrong. Amen? Hallelujah? So Solomon had to learn it the hard way. It's not going to be the way we thought it would be all the time, and it's not going to be the way we prefer it to be all the time. But people who struggle conclude from that that God is not fair. And from that, they conclude that he is not trustworthy. And then they conclude from that that he is not worthy. And they become angry and cynical. And then they ask you a question, why do bad things happen to good people? And you better tell them, tell me more. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Point number eight. I just told you on this earth, in this life, things will not be fixed and predictable like you think, right? Well, here's the thing that's very important, that God's heart knows when we're not thinking about it. Eternity is very predictable. Eternity is very fixed. Amen. Things are not going to be black and white and fit a pattern that you think it should fit right now because for much, much, much longer than that, it will be black and white. That's right. Amen. Time will be up. That's right. God's heart can bleed all at once. Jesus' blood will not be able to reach people. Yes, yes, yes. And good people will have only good things. But the other side of that coin is that bad people have eternity to only have bad things. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Point number nine. Eternity? How long is eternity? Think about it. How long is eternity? And how long do we live? Some 20 years, we call it tragic. Some 40 years, we call that tragic. Some 60 years, now we're getting somewhere. Many 80 years, we think that's par for the course. If they live to be a century of years, what is that housed in the vault of eternity? It's nothing. What I'm trying to tell you is not only is this life nothing, I'm not trying to minimize any pain, any sorrow that we go through, but understand that you will have, if you are doing right, if you love God, if you go through pain here, you will have eternity to have no tears, to have no sorrow, to have no pain, to have no death. And those that we would put all the bad stuff on, they will have an eternity, which is a really long time right. to suffer. Why is this important? Not just because of the amount of time, but because of the disproportionate and unwise and ill-advised emphasis that we put on this life. I mean outside of your purpose. I mean outside of thanking your God and lifting him up as he deserves. I mean all the other stuff. All the other stuff that we already know has to happen because of sin. Why are you wringing your hands in this little bit of time over something?
something that's inevitable. And whatever you're going through, if you could look far enough, somebody's got it worse. Your cup is way more than half filled. Oh, I'm 20, I'm 40 years old and I got cancer. Somebody had to look at their baby die as soon as they were born. Where would you draw the line? We need to thank God for what we have. Why do bad things happen to good people? Who are you calling good? Why you judge God? Who are you calling good? Why you judge God? How dare we focus so much on this? God's heart breaks for you if you suffer. But when we ask, why do bad things happen to good people? We must understand why bad things happen at all. And why we only really care about those good people when we decide they're good. We err. Amen? And God loves us anyhow. But just don't be surprised if God doesn't follow your lead. Just don't be surprised if he doesn't adopt your scoring system. Just don't be surprised if he starts to decide to focus on your little 70 years. And if you suffer for 20 of those even, it's 20 within 70 within eternity. Just don't be surprised that even though God loves you, even though God doesn't, he's not happy that you're suffering, but he knows that sin was going to cause suffering. Don't be surprised that even if you indict him, don't be surprised. And even if you blame him, don't be surprised if he doesn't continue to be God. Don't be surprised if he doesn't continue to make decisions based on the big perspective that he has and not the perspective that you have because your little G God will give in and give you what you want knowing it will damage you. Give you what you want knowing it will destroy you. Give you what you want but the big G God is going to continue to be God. He's going to continue to love those that seem unlovable. He's going to continue to promise you an eternity of joy, even though he doesn't solve your every problem. He doesn't take away your every pain. He doesn't take away every barrier. And he cannot force you to love him through your pain. He cannot force you to love him. Remember last week we learned choice. You still have a choice, but he's still going to be God. Adam and Eve didn't deserve for God to kill an animal to cover them up, but he was still God. After all that dastardly stuff that happened and then Noah came and then they built the the, the tower, they didn't deserve to just have their languages changed. They deserved to be struck down. And all of the things that have happened in our lives when we slapped God in the face, we didn't deserve Jesus to be slapped and beaten and to hang on that cross. Eternity is a whole long time. Amen. Don't be surprised if God invests more of his actions on your eternity than to try to please you and solve every problem and every pain and every disappointment and every frustration you have in this tiny little finite time. This is not minimizing. Remember, this is why we have to understand the heart of God. No way would he minimize it, but understand the perspective that he has. He actually knows what's going on behind the scenes, Job. He actually understands eternity while it boggles our mind. He knows where the universe ends or whether it ends because he created it. We're still just trying to play around with it. We're still trying to understand it. Eternity is a lot longer. Doesn't it make sense for God to take care of eternity and to spend more and prioritize eternity versus everything we would go through here? We're going to look back at this and say, man, that was like the bink of an eye. Did that even happen? But right now, 
our little finite minds, but we want to judge God based on that. That's the created trying to judge the creator. That's the finite trying to judge the infinite. That's the time-based, space-based, trying to judge the one that's not bound by any of that. Amen? Point number 10. See, I got to 10. <laughs> if you look in the book of John, chapter 16, verse 33, you will see where Jesus says that he will give us peace, but he will not give us peace by fixing this earth. He will give us peace because he has overcome this world. Amen. He said, I'm going to give you peace not by fixing this world. I'm going to give you peace because you're connected to me and I have overcome this world. And knowing that not only troubles, but also death is inevitable for all of us. Amen. Amen. Paul wrote this in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verses 27 and 28. It says, as it is appointed unto man once to die, sin by the sacrifice of him, so I'm sorry, forgive me, appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him, amen, unto them that look for him, I hope you're one of those that looks for him, shall he appear amen. Amen. the second time without sin unto salvation. Jesus says, that every one of us has to die. We want to argue about when we die, how long the life is, what kind of death we have, are we in pain, that's not fair. It's appointed unto men, all of us, to die. But Christ's blood was offered for the reason why we have the pain. We want to focus on the symptom and he's solving the problem. We want to focus on how long the symptoms were. When I do a history on somebody, I want to know what happened, how long, did it move from here to there, were there any other associated symptoms. God is focused on the problem, the origin of the problem, amen? And so those who come to him as a doctor, those who come to him, uh, they know that when he appears the second time, they won't have to worry. But the question, why do bad things happen to good people, is focused on this time and this time only. God cares about everything that happens to us. But he has the big picture in mind. So if he doesn't move when you think it should move, just understand he's not going to stop having the big picture in mind just because we have a need. And he meets most of our needs. We just get mad at him for the ones he doesn't. When we complain about him and to him, we're using his oxygen. We're doing it with the roof that he put over our heads. So God rightly focuses most of his energy on your eternity and not your little finite time here. And while we worry about when we die, how we're going to die, God is more concerned with what's going to happen after you die. Would you rather he flip that script? Would you rather he do what, you know, some pastor, some people do? Take scriptures out of context so that you can focus on all the stuff in the here and now? So that you can have some faulty doctrine and think that you're not going to go through anything. And so when you do, then you have reason to blame God or tell the person they didn't have enough faith. There's all kinds of folks whose whole ministry are based on that, the here and the now. And the, you shouldn't have any pain and you should only be blessed and it's all good. Well, you know what? Even if you love God, do you think Stephen was good? Do you think that Paul, after?
after he got his life right was good? Was Peter, did God decide, even though he denied him three times, did, God, did Jesus decide that he was good enough to lead his church? Tough things, difficult things, painful things, saddening things, tragic things, hard things are going to happen to people that we would view as good. And those who do bad things, those who are violent, those who manifest sin in ways that are dastardly that we would terribly be angry about, God is going to keep loving them while they still have a breath in their body. Amen? Amen. Because there's an eternity for bad getting bad, eye for an eye, and there's an eternity where we will have good, no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain. So let's thank God for caring enough to take the time and address this subject. He didn't have to. He didn't have to get on the witness stand. He did not have to answer for himself. He did not have to explain this, especially to those who are mad and angry at him because he hasn't done things the way that they think he should. And I just pray for all of us that these points find the place in your heart and that they stick and that you have the peace of God that passes all understanding and that will keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. And to God be the glory. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for caring enough to come and talk to us and explain some things to us, Lord God, and to help us have the right perspective, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for never enjoying any pain that we suffer, whether we love you or whether we don't. Thank you, God, for caring more about our eternity than our little finite time here, Lord God. Thank you, God, for all the things that you do for us as opposed to our focus on things you don't do for us, Lord God. Thank you for the pain I don't have instead of just focusing on the pain I do have. Thank you for the limbs that do move, Lord, instead of me just complaining about the limbs that don't move, Lord. Thank you for the voice I do have, Lord, as opposed to the voice that I don't have, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord.